let's see. Uh, oh, eight fourteen. Okay. Oh wow, we have lots of lots of agenda. Well, oh, yeah. I didn't add yours because I figured you could. I can. <clears throat> hmm? I can. I know. Oh. Okay. Should we, uh, I guess we have a packed agenda. Should we get started? Yep, let's go. Is, is Chris actually here? Good to see him. We only have two people. I guess he probably just wants another plug for EnvoyCon. The, the CFPs are due in like two, a week, two weeks or something like that. It does, so, yeah. so if people can submit, that would be awesome. Uh, I'm happy to help with CFPs if anyone wants it, who's listening in on the recording, uh, or I'm sure other people would too. So, great. Do you want to talk about fuzzing, Harvey? Yeah, just a general heads up that, you know, a lot of fuzzes have been landed. I, I kind of feel that we now have good coverage of most of the interesting parts of the data plane. I would like folks who if folks are aware of things which are not covered and they're interested in having fuzzes written or there are other parts which are not data plane related where we can get a high payoff from fuzzing, please do reach out to me and I'm happy to uh, consider adding such fuzzers and or at least getting on the roadmap for fuzzing so we know where um, we can best focus our efforts there going forward. So that's, that's just uh, a quick advertisement there. Uh, yes. Then on to client versus GCC. Wait, so, sorry, just on the on the fuzzing thing, just just for our offline conversation, just for everyone's benefit. Um, I I mean I, I think you've done an awesome job on getting all of this working, but I think we're all on the same page that it's worth it at this point just to burn down the existing yeah. bugs. Basically, is that yeah, that's, that's the plan? We, effectively, have, uh, somewhere between thirty and forty of these bugs now. Um, but all, some of them are related to just the test themselves or the integration or, or the like integration test flakes and that kind of thing. So I'll hopefully I'll just provide a general improvement to stability as we address them. There's been some interesting ones just pop up in the last few days with some of these like Tetapaza ones have come up. So well, we can look into them. I think they're ex exercising some very unusual situations, like very, you know, strange, very large timestamps and epochs and things like that. But we should, we should generally just fix these things. Uh, yep. So yeah, that, that, that's kind of the plan is to uh, actually burn those down and also just understand buzzer efficacy. There's a lot of metrics we can look at to improve things like, you know, how uh, there's both stability metrics, there's coverage metrics, and there's like invocation rate metrics, which can be used to uh, guide, you know, how you want to tune a, a buzzer to actually do a better job and uh, I plan on actually making use of some of those. Do you, do, you, do you want to briefly just talk about that meeting that we had about the net specter stuff? Like, I don't think there's anything secret about it. I mean, it's somewhat, somewhat related. Yeah, Google, uh, we, we, we'll be looking at uh, tooling around uh, support for detecting specter gadgets coming uh, in, in the coming weeks. And we have folks at Google who are interested in this and working on in this, in this area. And this isn't that's, uh, you know, particularly important given the recent uh, net specter paper where people demonstrated remote um, exploitation of specter by uh, packet timing essentially. And that's, uh, yeah, definitely kind of interesting. Cool. Sweet. Anyone have any uh, thoughts or comments on that stuff? Yeah, we're just generally in security hardening. I mean, that's that's an area where we're generally interested um, these days at Google. And, yeah, it's something that we would like to basically take on most things that are reasonable in that space and at least get them prioritized and, uh, you know, go after the low-hanging, biggest bang for buck first uh, sort of uh, efforts. I mean, you know, one thing we can definitely do is get Coverity back online. Um, that's something which is in the, in the, in the backlog. Yeah, I mean, like we should we should definitely do that. I I think again from from our offline conversations, you and I are on the same page that covariety is generally a sea of false positives, yeah. which 
which is a waste of time. But I, I see no reason not to turn it back on since I think it's pretty trivial to do yeah, so. Even if we only give that, you know, report a glance every few months, I think that's better than not having it. Yep. Um, yeah, there, there are some other things we can look at also in the area of hardening, like um, Clang has um, stack smash. Yep. Uh, well, it's which we don't turn on today. I think it can be some performance co uh, cost. There's, there's also like a, net, a safe integer libraries and things like that, like that, that can be used instead of uh, defaults. You know, whether we want to turn all of these on in the default hot build or not, maybe not, but we may, it may even make sense to have a hardened version of Envoy where for folks who are, you know, using this, for example, on in edge applications versus internal applications where traffic's largely trusted and. You know, over, over time, that might make sense. There's also other things that I think could be interesting to explore. For example, cutting out of Envoy things which aren't necessary. So examples include, like, do you really need JSON and YAML support from a, for some folks? Do you think yeah. it's more optional? Could you, um, you know, make codecs optional or, you know, that, that kind of thing? Uh, do you need H1 or H2 support? And most of the actually interesting ones, I think, there, are places where we can reduce dependencies on third party software and data plane. Because, you know, when you're looking, when you're doing a security analysis of Envoy, Envoy is just one part of the picture. And in terms of trust, I actually think we have a very healthy relationship in, in Envoy. And I think most of the contributors are, uh, like most contributions have, uh, are, are systematically reviewed by people who um, I think most of the people in the Envoy community will tr would trust. Um, other projects, I don't have the same understanding of. I know some of these projects, most of our dependencies are either good rule originated or using many other places. But beyond that, actually understanding the nature of the communities and how you know, easy it would be for exports to sneak into them, I don't have as good a feel for. Yep. So, yeah, yeah I mean, this is all, I think, super valuable work. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm very happy that it's happening. Is it feasible for someone to go and add fuzzing of say, like extensions, or is it something that requires uh, access to whatever the systems that are actually running the tests, or is it just a matter of, of knowing how to do it, or is there? Oh, yeah. It's actually very easy to do, and there's a lot of good examples. I actually plan on writing up um, a Medium post on fuzzing in the, in the coming few weeks, and now it's sort of explain the basics and how to add these. So if you own an extension and want to add fuzzing, that will be the place to sort of maybe take it to start from, but it's okay. actually, it, it's really, it can be as simple as like, you know, if you, if you can, in particular, if you can find your fuzz inputs in proto form um, or your data model in proto form, it, it, it can be as simple as like 50 lines of code and you have a fuzzer. I mean, we, I added the, 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 a fuzzer for the route lookup table uh, the other day, which in about an hour and a half and that it now exercises all the route lookup and uh, you know path matching stuff, and that, that that was a pretty big win for a very little modest effort. And so I would generally actually encourage people who write extensions to do that. I mean, and also people people who write non-trivial data structures. So a good example might be like the LC try. That would be a good thing to fuzz. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, having a having a blog post and, and some and some getting started documentation, I, I I think would be awesome. I've been really impressed with how powerful the whole framework is. It's pretty incredible what what you can yeah. do. Yeah, particularly uh, we have some documentation yeah. like that uh, already, but uh, it, it could definitely be improved for uh, making it more like a tutorial than a uh, hey, here are the yeah, basic right. just steps for uh, getting the build to happen and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and like. I think just some discussion since you've oh, done ooh, yeah. since you've done so much of the like so much different tests now. I think even just some best practices because it seems like when you build these fuzz tests using Proto, like that's when you can do really incredible things. But even just some guidelines from your experience on the the way to think about it, like it's unclear to me how you're generating some of the corpus. So, so, so even just like some general yeah. discussion of how you've approached some of the tests, I think would be really useful from a learning perspective. Yeah, no, that, that, that is definitely fine. So I'll, I'll get that out there and uh, hopefully we can get other folks in the community also building fuzzers. And yeah, that would be uh, fantastic. Yeah, distribute that effort. Cool. So yeah, uh, I think we're going to probably- Well, that's a good, 
I, I think that's a good segue into talking about compiler stuff because you yeah. had talked about turning on stack, you know, stack guards and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so I, I think Piotr opened uh, a, a PR just to change the default compiler to Clang. Um, I, I think this is something that I, I've been thinking about for a while in, in terms of, do we want to switch over to Clang? It seems like that's where the industry is going. Um, so I'm like, I'm for it. Uh, I just think it might need a little more thinking and diligence than just making the change. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess I'm, I'm curious what people think, but the, the three things, you know, given magical resources that we might not have that I've been thinking about is, I think we should move from Clang 5 to Clang 6. So that includes Clang 6 since it's now released Clang 6 format. Um, so essentially upgrading Clang. Uh, aren't people up to Clang 8? Like, uh, should we be getting Clang 7? Is there... Clang 7 is the current development version as far as I know. So Clang 6 is the last like release version, I, I think. It's what I saw Clang 8 the other day when I was looking at some documentation. Then maybe they just released Clang Seven. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I know that in the Ubuntu repos, Clang Six is definitely the one that they have, and then it's mainline. I, I'm, I'm guessing what you saw is they're probably about to release Clang Seven, and that's, and that's why it's switched to Clang Eight, probably. I see that. That probably makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So but like, we, I mean, but we should since we're, I guess, clearly very far behind. We yeah. should at least switch to Clang. Um, six, particularly because now that they build those Debian packages for Ubuntu, like it's super easy uh, to, to actually upgrade. So I think we should do that. Um, the other thing that I, so then, so I guess there's switch to Clang 6 or Clang 7. There's whether we want to switch the default builds. There's potentially do want to revisit some of the compile flags, like turn on uh, stack guards and other things. Um, I would, so I would like to re revisit using FLTO. So that's the, that's the full program optimization. Um, yeah. What would you train the FLTO on? So you don't, so there's, there's two separate things. So FLTO is just whole program optimization without, without oh. any training. And then there's the, there's the PGO, the profile guided optimization. So I'm just proposing turning on FLTO or at least experimenting with it. The reason, just, just for historical context, the reason that Envoy has not historically used FLTO is that at least as of about three years ago, GCC has historically had problems with debug symbols when FLTO is on. So like the code might be faster, but then if you look at a core dump, like symbols and call stacks are all messed up. Um, I'm guessing that's been fixed now, but I honestly haven't looked at this in several years. So, you know, it would be worth just looking into like, what does FLTO do for like a standard performance run, at least for some, for some real world use cases? Um, does a core dump look correct? Like, can you debug it basically? Um, so, those are the three things that I've been thinking about. Um, are, are, are there things that other folks have been thinking about? Um, I would just put out that the, 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 the motivation for Piotr's work is that Istio have had some serious performance. Uh, so what, what's come up is some people using Istio when they configure like thousand, order a thousand listeners. And this is, you know, obviously with the original destination routing stuff, are seeing like incredibly slow load times, like minutes. And they're deciding that Envoy, what well, Istio, and by implication Envoy, um, isn't scaling uh, practically. And so Piotr and Lizanne and so on are engaged right now in a bunch of work on trying to get to the roots of this. And one of the things did end up being in LC try, and it was uh, sort of solved by switching to Clang. But yeah, that, 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 that's just some background context. So um, uh, in terms of the actual uh, things to, to actually consider turning on, yeah, I think these are all interesting. Well, one thing we, we really would benefit from, and this is a lot of work, so I don't think this is going to happen overnight and maybe not at all, is a way to systematically make these decisions by having an open source performance framework for Envoy. I, so I, I agree. Like, like these are the tests we run. We saw this regression of 5% or improvement of 10%. 
I agree. That decision. That's like the rational thing to do. Building that out is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's something I would, I would love to work on and maybe sometime in the future I will do that. Actually, ironically, getting, getting physical machine resources to do that is actually not a problem because CNCF has a test cluster. So like we, yeah. we, we have computers and a network that we could use to actually do such a thing. Obviously, building the thing with like how you deploy and like actually monitor and do all those things, that's like a multi-month effort. Yeah, um, yeah, stable, low variance benchmark yeah, representative of what the community cares about. Like this is a, yeah, uh, a lot of work. Right. So the best that we can do currently, to be honest, is, you know, I think when we make some of these changes, like at Lyft, we can do some basic performance sanity checks. I, it seems like the folks over at Pinterest generally do perf work, like they can test some things. Like once Google is using it more in production, like you'll be able to run run, run some benchmarks. Yeah, we, we, we have teams building internal benchmarks, which, which actually fill this role. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of like after the fact, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I guess what I would suggest is uh, like, it seems like, so there's two things. So there's the, there's the LC try thing. And it seems like that was fixed by Brian Payne's PR. So it's like, I don't, I don't know that the Clang fix is even needed. Um, the other high level comment that I would say, which is probably obvious to people is that like with, with regard to Istio and people using thousands of listeners, um, you know, I would say that sometimes some of the use cases I would not consider reasonable. So like Envoy is not being used in a reasonable way. So there's, there's like, there's, there's performance fixes that we should investigate, but that doesn't mean that like every benchmark that people say is slow means that we have to change the world. Like that's my, that's my only point. I agree. I mean, you know, looking at like the specifics there, it seems that there are multiple ways of fixing that problem. They basically provision like all the services to all. Exactly. The I've nodes. told them this many times, like they cannot do what they're doing, uh, but, but they do it anyway. So I'm just, I, I'm just making the point that I'm not opposed to performance fixes. We should absolutely do yeah. them. I just think that we have to look at the big picture, which is that like we, you know, in, in helping people use on mode, we have to also help them use it in a reasonable way. That's my only point. Yep. That's, that's fair. Um, so I, I, I don't, I feel like with Piotr's PR, I don't, I just don't feel like enough diligence has been done. So I would still propose that we close it and open another tracking issue on like upgrade Clang, try to get some input on people testing Clang in, in some production environment to look for like obvious regressions. And then maybe at some point, I or someone else can do some investigation on FLTO and determine whether we want to turn that on or not. Those are, and then I think in there too, we can talk about, do we want to turn on the uh, stack guards, maybe look at the perf delta for that. Like there's a couple other things. I see no reason personally, like I feel like the Docker image that we export from the project should be as security hardened as possible at the expense of perf. Um, and then if, you know, we can have guides that say, you know, if you like want to have maximum perf, you could turn off this stack compile flag or something, but, but yeah, you know, but, but again, like that's something that we can, we can chat about. Yeah, no, I kind of agree. I mean, that will also put us in a better position if we need to like deal with the security response or something like that, like uh, by having more things out there, which are by default safe. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So do we then, um, so I guess what would the, so do people agree that we should potentially close his PR and like open a tracking issue or do we want to continue to discuss in the context of that PR? I think close, it's, it's, it's a bigger issue than just that. One okay. PR. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, anyone else have any comments on the compiler issues? Action. So we're now using Clang 5. Right? Sorry, what? Upstream, we're now using Clang 5. Yeah, baked in, like we, we download from the Debian repo um, and we're using Clang 5 now. So I think just like switching to Clang 6 is a total no brainer. And I think, I, I think Piotr has a PR for that somewhere. So we should just do that. Like that, that one is, is just easy. So let's just do that. 
Um, and then I think whether we switch the release Docker image to Clang, I think that's an open discussion. And then obviously these other compile flags like FLTO and stack guards and whatever, I feel like that's a, that's a separate conversation. Um, I was just Googling around. I think Xcode is actually based on Clang 4. <laughs> really? How, how, like, they, don't, they, they stopped a few versions of Xcode ago. They stopped telling you what version of Clang their compiler was based off of. So did they fork it and like they're they're forked now or I, I really? Could be. I know I know someone at Apple that we can ask about that. So okay. I will I will find out. I mean, it's probably fine. I think it may be a problem someday when you want to switch to C plus plus some newer year may eventually be a problem. And I think the other stuff is just flags that you're not going to, maybe not going to be able to turn on in the, in the Mac build, which is okay. It would probably be easier and cheaper if I just went around and gave everyone an Ubuntu ThinkPad and then we could just uh, drop this whole OSX situation and then we wouldn't have this problem anymore, would we? Okay. There we go. Anyway, I'm just throwing it out there. I don't think... <laughs> Uh, no, that's a that's a good point. I, I don't I have no idea what the implications are there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, looks like next is uh, packed header format. Who, who put that on there? I, I put it on there. Uh, Mike Shore, I don't think is dialed in, but uh, essentially there's a discussion of like, hey, let's do a packed header format, and then he's like, I just want to make progress. I don't feel like I, I I don't know if anyone has opinions on what that format should be, but it'd be nice to decide one so he can go make more progress. I mean, it seems like for better or worse that we've already decided on things like for the XFCC header, we're doing, I think, semicolon delimited. So, oh. I, I mean, like all, all things being equal, I would say we should just try to be consistent, but I haven't thought about it that much. You probably want to bring Piotr in on this discussion because there's an RFC for like- Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. That he's missing out. No, but I think we would actually like, we're maybe missing out because he actually has some uh, he, like he, he, he attends IETF and speaks to folks who are designing headers and stuff. And apparently there's an RFC on how to, you know, create these sort of like list based headers and in uh, and, and, and a, and, and a way which is, you know, standardized and hopefully will be adopted more widely for other standard headers going forward. And this has come up in other discussions, like with the uh, Envoy error return, error propagation, yeah. uh, reverse propagation. And, uh, I, I'm kind of, yes, I, I was originally very sort of pro and gung-ho about using JSON and Proto and stuff like that, but I'm, I've been persuaded that uh, uh, the, the right thing to do is actually just basically do whatever's in this RFC. Yeah, I mean, if there's some RFC, let's, I, that sounds good. Let's definitely look at that. Um, I, I do think we have to consider some existing places like XFCC where we are doing this. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's fine. Like we can just call that header legacy or something and, and we're going to do this new version or we can have a, a option that does old style and then the, and then the standard or something. Um, yeah, okay. I, I guess, can we loop Piotr in, into that issue? I yeah. think for I think for Mike Shore's case, um, yeah, uh, it's it, it's problematic because what he wants to do is going to require changes in Lyft's client apps, and obviously once we roll that out, that's a giant pain to change. So the... it would be nice to, to to figure something out that's a, that's a little more concrete. I don't I don't think what he's working on is so burning urgent that we can't spend like a week or two trying to come to some consensus here. So should we tag Piotr in that issue and try to get a link to that RFC? Yeah, I, I just dug up the uh, RFC from a prior thread with Piotr. So okay. I, think yeah. I got it. Structured headers for HTTP. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Awesome. Okay. I'll post that in the bug as well. Okay. Great. Or just those two and people can weigh in, but please do weigh in. All right. Sweet. Uh, last issue looks like controlling time and integration tests. What's that? Yeah. This is, this is mine. This is just, I, I've noticed while looking around the code and also we've been burned recently with some test flakes that a lot of code is uh, pretty much just using real time when in the context of integration tests. And I was surprised by that. And I thought maybe there should be some way to pass down like a, um, a time, you know, a time source um, 
from the server or something that in the context of an integration test would be simulated. And I thought that might be a bunch of refactors, which I wanted to just get a sense, is that going to be something that we want to see or is that something where we just want integration tests to use real time and just make the timeouts long enough so flakes happen less often? Uh, no, I, you and I are on the same page. Like I, I hate statics. I hate real time. Like I would, I would love to purge it all. I, I think it's just the code has grown organically to, 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 to be like it is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so if, if, uh, if we start generating some refactors, they'll, uh, they'll, uh, as long as it's kind of in that direction, that'll make sense. Yeah, I mean, one like while we're while we're on this topic, one one thing that I would love to we're kind of out of time, but like one thing that I'd love to figure out, maybe we can do it over email or something. Is I feel like with the integration tests in particular, we need we need to have some like we should have some guide around like how to test it before submitting it, just because it has flakes. But anyway, we can talk about that next time. We're doing kids out, okay. so yeah, we have to go. Okay. okay. That's good. Ciao. All right. Anyone else have anything? No. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.